Let's turn in our manuals. Page 25. Actually, 24. Because we were there earlier. Holiness and power. We'd mentioned Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Mentioned Titus chapter 2. At the end of Titus 2, we'd stopped at uh, verse 6. Verse 7 on the next page says, In all things, showing yourself a pattern of good works. Not just a good work every now and then. A pattern. Now, I don't know if you know it, but this verse does so much damage to those people that think that God just comes on a person for a time and to do something. You know, this verse says you should have a pattern in your life of good works. Why? Because the Spirit is always present with you. The power of God is always present to heal. And so you ought to show a pattern of good works. It should be that if somebody is walking behind you about 50 yards, they ought to be able to look ahead of you and say, you see that person there? Watch this. He's going to go over and talk to that person. You see that person, you see that, see that, that, that person holding up the sign? You watch this. I guarantee you, you watch. He's going to pull money out of his pocket and give him something. You ought to have a pattern of good works in your life. You hear what I'm saying? A pattern. Not, well, I'm just being led by the Spirit. No, you're not. No, not unless you have a pattern of good works. Because the Spirit leads you to obey the Bible. And you should have a pattern of good works. Do you get that? You need to drill that in. Right? Because that goes so much against the flow of things today. Verse 8. Sound, well, I guess I should finish the rest of it. In all things, showing yourself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Hear that? He that's of the contrary part. In other words, people that would disagree with that, people that would disagree with you, right? Uh, they should be ashamed. You say, well, then, uh, are you talking about Christians or non-Christians? Well, Christians shouldn't be doing it. And if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. Those that are in Christ that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, there it shows you that if you walk after the flesh, there can still be shame, right? So, but there shouldn't be. You shouldn't be contrary to the, these things that Paul was telling Titus to live. There's, we've got to get back. We've got to realize these were real people. They had problems just like you did. They weren't super special, living off in somewhere where they weren't tempted and didn't have problems and didn't have, No, they were real people, and yet they still lived holy before God. Right? So we got no excuse. So, Romans chapter 6, verse 19, Paul says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Now, notice he said infirmity of your flesh. He wasn't talking about sickness or disease. He, said, I'm, I, he didn't say, I'm talking to you like a man talks to you because you got a disease. He didn't say that. He said, I'm talking to you like a, I'm talking to you as a man. I'm talking straightforward, not pulling any punches. Why? Because of the weakness of your flesh that you flail and fail, I should say, and that you fall. He said, you shouldn't be doing that. He said, that's a weakness of the flesh. You need to cut it out. He says, for as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. You hear that? He said, I'm just backing up what I'm saying here, what I said earlier. He said, I'm talking to you like a man. I'm talking to you straightforward, not pulling any punches. Because of your weakness of flesh, you give your members to serve over. When he says your members, he's talking about parts of your body. He said, you give that over in uncleanness. And you do iniquity after iniquity. And you go into it. And he calls that an infirmity of the flesh. Not sickness or disease. He's calling it a weakness of your human nature, you might say, that you fall, and he said that you stop it. Right? That's not how you're supposed to, leave, to live. Even He said, as you did that before, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. You hear that? Live righteous, which leads to holiness. And he said, don't let your body dictate what you're going to do. Well, I couldn't help it. You know, I just, I, just, I just couldn't help myself. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You can help yourself. Usually, though, you help yourself do the wrong thing. Okay? You have to change your mind, change your thought. Don't let yourself th think on things that you don't need to think on. Have dominion over your own life. Right? Over your own body, over your own thoughts, over your own speech. And people say, well, you know, the Bible says that no man can tame the tongue. Well, why do you think he gave you the Holy Ghost? who is not a man. He gave you the Holy Ghost to tame your tongue. Right? That's one of the fastest ways to find out how spirit-filled a person is. They'll be up front shouting, jumping, praying, in, you know, speaking in tongues, 
want to give a prophecy, want to give a tongue and interpretation. And then before they walk out the door, they're gossiping, backbiting and turn around and talking about people and everything else. You say, no, the spirit might have came on you, but he didn't stay long. Right? And that ain't him talking back there at the back door about this person, that person. Amen? At some point, listen, your life has to line up with the word of God. Right? When you die or whatever happens, you know, however you get there, you're going to go to the place that is most like you. You get that? You're going to go to the place that you are most fitted for. And it's up to you now to decide what place you're fitted for. Right? So God's not going to... Listen, I've, I've heard people say these different things. Well, well, that person's going to go to heaven. That person's going to go to heaven. Well, if they do, guess what? It won't be heaven no more. Why? You understand? You understand? I'm, not, I'm not talking about people that don't repent. Right? I mean, I'm not talking about people that, that repent. And I'm talking about people that think that they can live any kind of life they want and want to live those kind of lives and then think they're still going to heaven. Okay? That is a lie. Okay? You were, if you are born again, you are recreated in righteousness and true holiness. You are recreated like that. That's who you are. And if that's not who you are, you need to get saved. Right? If you desire, you know, if, if you restrain yourself from going out drinking, partying, and whoring around, guess what? You need to get saved. That's not, that's not a struggle in you. That's you not being born again. Right? Is that plain enough? Okay. All right. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about where I stand on this? All right? <laughs> now, he says, uh, verse 20, For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. And all he's saying is, well, now that you're servants of righteousness, you should be free from sin. Amen. And if you got any questions on that, you ought to read Finney sometime. I'm telling you, Finney will clean your clock. <laughs> I'm not kidding. He, you know, you read it, you get saved every day. I'm just over, you know, you just constantly. <laughs> so he says, <clears throat> verse 21, What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, that's in, that's in 2 Corinthians. That's New Covenant, New Testament, Right? And he tells us what we are to do. Ephesians 4, 24. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Just quoted that. 1 Thessalonians 3, 13. To the end, that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 through 7. Verse 1 says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk and to please God. You hear that? You ought to walk in a way that is pleasing to God. You ought to walk and please God. You got that? <clears throat> in a way that you walk and please God. So you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. What does sanctification mean? That means separation from unrighteousness to righteousness. It means separation. It means to be made holy. It means to be taken from profane or secular use for holy use. Right? Whenever it says that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice and that that is a, our, our reasonable service. That word reasonable is the Greek word logikos and it's where we get the word logical. It is your well-reasoned and logical service to present your body a living sacrifice. Isn't that amazing? Right? 
It's logical. Go look it up. It's logicos. It's neat. It's, uh, it's funny how you look at the words and how they relay over. <clears throat> then he says, uh, For this will of God, even your sanctification. Now notice this. He's talking about sanctification. That you should abstain from fornication. So apparently, your actions have something to do with your sanctification. Isn't that something? Well, you don't understand. I've been sanctified. I've been purified. I've been, okay, you know, it's something you don't understand. Is that God is eternal, so He speaks eternally. If He ever said it, it's still echoing. Right? And so He speaks, and it's still speaking. Right? And so He has to speak with the end result. He can't give the first part, so He has to tell us, your sanctification, and now He tells us how to do it. So when He tells us, He says that you abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess His vessel... In sanctification and honor. In other words, you ought, to, you ought to know how to stay away from fornication. That's what he's telling them. How do you do that? Easy. Don't think about it. Turn, when you see something, turn the other way. Right? You, you stand at the Walmart checkout counter and you got all the, you know, different magazines and stuff. Start turning them around. Of course, now they've got as bad as stuff on the back covers as they did on the front. Right? So just start, you know. Uh, I don't care, you know, act drunk, fall over, knock all the magazines off, you know, something, I don't know. Something. <laughs> They'll see you come and go, oh, there's that guy, he's drunk again. You watch, he's going to knock every magazine off here. <laughs> so, ah, we're not drunk as you suppose, we're being holy. Amen? <laughs> Am I at the wrong crowd? Have I got a wrong crowd? I don't know, because I'm, I'm pretty lively. <laughs> I got life, amen? So, okay. All right. Verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess its vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, right? In other words, keep your mind clean, keep your body clean, do what's right. Even as the Gentiles which know not God. In other words, you know God, quit acting like you don't. This is pretty simple. It's pretty simple stuff. Isn't it? This isn't, you know, it might be deep theology, but it's simple, right? That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. You hear that? Even a brother. He's talking to Christians and says, you act this way, guess what? God will avenge. Think about that. See, everybody thinks, well, no, I'm in Christ now and I can do anything and it ain't going to matter because it's all been paid for. That is not what the Bible says. See? And the people that believe that is because they're not reading the Bible for themselves. They're hearing another gospel. And they're going after it because they're finding something that they've been looking for, which is not the truth, but which is a way to live like a devil and think you're still going to heaven. Right? No devil's in heaven anymore. Or anybody like him. You get that? Okay. <clears throat> because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. You hear that? That's a way of living. 1 Timothy 2.15 Notwithstanding, this is talking about women here, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, the only reason I included this is because I want you to realize, notice they say they will be saved in childbearing. Now, obviously, this is another one of those places where it's not talking about eternal salvation. Right? It's not saying uh, women, if you have a baby, you're going to heaven. Right? That's not what he's saying. Right? This goes back to what I was saying earlier about all who call upon the name of the Lord will be delivered out of that situation. You hear that? So I'm just verifying what we said earlier. Notice what it says, though. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. It means living a sober life, a, a not a confused life, a clean, straight life. Now notice, isn't it strange here? That it says that they'll be saved if they continue in these things. And one of those things they are told to continue in is holiness. So holiness is a way of living and has to do with the way you live. And you can live holy or live unholy. You get that? So this idea that, well, my spirit's been made holy, so everything's good. Well, okay, if your spirit's been made holy, we'll know because you're going to live holy. Isn't that simple? It's in a matter of, well, you know, I'm, I'm holy inside. Well, you sure don't act holy outside. Right? And our lives are supposed to be an open epistle. I shouldn't have to guess if you're holy or not. Amen? Mm -hmm. okay, am I going to have to go find another crowd? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody do this right here. Make sure you're living. 
Right, make, is, your, is your pulse still beating? Are we sure? All right. Okay. Just trying to make sure. <clears throat> now, I know what you're all thinking now. Somebody take those Thumbraw DVDs away from him. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12 verse 10 for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness God corrects he instructs he disciplines now that doesn't mean he makes you sick right he instructs us by his word he instructs us his rod and his staff those are his word and that's how he instructs us. The word of God is given for our correction, for our instruction in righteousness. It's the word of God, right? All, every word of scripture is for that. It doesn't say sickness is for that. It says scripture is for that. And so that's how he does that. But now notice, he does that and he corrects us. He chastens us so that we can be partakers of his holiness, right? And if you're not chastened, if you can read the word of God and not see where you need to change, the Bible says you are a bastard. It means that God is not your father. That's what the Bible says. Now realize that. You need to be able to take correction and instruction through the word of God by the spirit of God. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Hebrews chapter 12, Verse 14. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness. Well, now, if you're automatically made holy, how do you follow holiness? You see? Automatically, there's holiness. Now, you, if, as you're born again, it tells you to continue to walk after these things and to follow holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. In other words, God has extended grace to you. Now, live like it. Right? Grace gives you the ability to live above sin, not live in sin. Jesus came to save us from our sins, not to save us in our sins. <clears throat> Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Isn't that funny that he ties Esau... Here and says, for one morsel of meat, he sold his birthright. And he says, don't be a, a fornicator. What does that mean? Fornicators sell their birthright for one piece of meat. Think about that. That's, I've, I've had people ask me different things and different things about ministry and being on the road and that kind of stuff and people and different things. And, and I told them, and I said, I never have to worry about that stuff. Why? Because there is not a piece of meat out there worth what I got. You understand? There's nothing out there worth me giving up what I got for. Amen? I told my wife a long time ago, she said, you know, some, well, another minister's wife, oh, you shouldn't let Curry go on the road by himself. No minister should ever be on the road by himself. Things happen out there. And I'm like, that woman's a devil. <laughs> trying to put doubt, trying to put problems in there, trying to, you know, put this root of, of suspicion or something like that. I told my wife, I said, listen, this may not be the most flattering thing you want to hear, but it's true. I do not sleep around because of you. I don't sleep around because of God. If I was going to sleep around on you, I could probably get around, get, you know, I'm gone all the time. I could probably do it and get away with it. But God's everywhere I go. And he knows everything I do. He sees everything I do. And I can't get nothing by him. Right? And I told her, I said, so you never have to worry about that because God is there. And I said, and I, I love you. So, you know, obviously I'm not going to do it anyway. But at the same time, you know, if you ever thought there was not there, you know, if there, you know, if we got in a big fight or something and then I left, you still ain't got to worry about it. Why? Because even if I fight with you, I ain't going to fight with him. <laughs> Amen. Like I said, it wasn't the most flattering thing, but hopefully it gave her enough. You know, she, she knew she knows that to be the truth. Right. So. All right. <clears throat> Verse 17. For, you know, how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, at the bottom of this page, you might, you might think, what is that? That's the wrong place for this, right? The reason I'm talking about this is because the main purpose 
of Dominion Bible Institute, of the satellite schools that we're starting around the, the, the world now, the main purpose for them is not information. It is to disciple. And it is to make sure that holiness is taught so that uh, the falseness, the, the wrong doctrines and things that are out there, you will, you will know what is true, you'll know what is right, and you'll know it more than just an idea or just words, but you'll know it in reality. And what the biggest thing missing in the church today, honestly, is just character. You know, most of the time there's no difference between the world and the church, and if there is, the church actually has more wrong with it because you're supposed to be able to trust it. And yet you got people that do all kinds of things that you know, just not right. And it's time that we get back to what's right. If we police ourselves, then maybe God won't have to do too much because we all know that judgment is supposed to start in the house of God. Right? And we don't want that. And the best way, if you judge yourselves, you won't be judged, the Bible says. Right? So, uh, next part here. We're going to look at the next and go right on. We're doing pretty good here, actually. Section 5 or Session 5. Now we're going to talk about some life team churches, and planting, targeting. Here's the key. The first thing, point A, is invasion. Remember, what we had to look at everything through what? The new creation, the kingdom, and sons of God. Isn't that right? <clears throat> point A, invasion. We must realize and act upon the fact that we are on this earth to bring an invasion of the kingdom of God. That's why you exist. Not to just have a good life or anything else. Right? It is to bring an invasion of the kingdom of God onto this earth, wherever you are. Not just in church, wherever you are. Wherever you step is holy ground. Right? So, we're not here for our own pleasure or comfort. Listen carefully, I'm fixing to give you a definition of the kingdom here. We are here to establish the rule of God in every area of our lives and every area in which we encounter the work of the enemy. Now, what is the definition of the kingdom? It's the rule of God. Right? That's the definition of the kingdom. As we go forth into the world, we must go forth in the power of the Spirit and with an accurate knowledge of the Word of God. Hence the Dominion Bible Institute reference and all of this. As in every war, invasion is not the goal. It is simply the key to getting started. The invasion must be for the purpose of colonization. So we go to point B, colonization. The goal of every invading army should be to establish colonies in the new territory and populate them with loyal citizens of the home kingdom. For us, this would relate to the establishment of local churches. Okay? Technically, the word ecclesia. Now, ecclesia was a political word, as I said before, <clears throat> for it literally was comparable to a city council or to the council that a king has that he discusses things with and then they bring it to pass. Okay? So, uh, we could say it would be like a board of directors, but that's really not the best way to say it. So, but the main thing here is that it is not, or it was not, a religious word. It was a political word word, not a religious word. Remember that. Okay? In uh, Isaiah chapter 7 and chapter 9 too, he talks about it. And he says that, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Right? Doesn't say the kingdom. Doesn't say the church. It says the government shall be upon his shoulders. The kingdom is the government of God. The kingdom is the rule of God. It is the system by, see we have a, a well, I'm not going to get into all that again. We talked about this last week, actually. But here in America, we have a constitutional republic. Okay? That's the way it was set up. Now, whether we go by it or not, that's a whole other question. But that's the way it's set up. Well, that's our system of government. Okay? The kingdom is God's system of government. It's the way he rules. That's why he says... The kingdom is like this, where a person does this, and here's what they do. And here's another story of the kingdom of how a man had two sons, and one does this, and he goes into all these stories. What's he doing? He's showing us how the kingdom operates, because the kingdom is the system by which God brings his will to pass. Okay? Now, uh, go to the next one. 
point C. So we've had invasion, then we talk about colonization. But there has to be planning and implementation. The planning and implementation of invasion and colonization must be both detailed and flexible. The enemy has gradually convinced Christians that there must be some special type of calling or anointing necessary for one to plant and grow a local fellowship, what we were talking about earlier. This may be true if the local fellowship we are discussing were to be like the average local church. But if we are talking about a biblical New Testament fellowship, then all that is needed is two or three believers. Jesus guaranteed his presence if that requirement is met. Matthew 18, 18 says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you, that if any two of you shall agree on earth as touching or concerning anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You hear that? Now we know that he dwells in us. And if we have two of us together, we know that he's in the midst of us. And if the two go different ways, in other words, you go back home or whatever it is, then we don't lose him. Right? All he's saying is, you, all we need for a church fellowship is two or three people gathered together in his name. That's all you need. And you'll notice there's nothing there about musical instruments. Nothing there about uh, any of the stuff that people see. Right? We've had people say, well, I can't do communion because I don't have wine or, or I don't have grape juice. Or I said, Tim, get water. Well, I don't have bread. Get a cracker. Right? Why? Because it's not the bread. It's not the wine. It's not the cracker. It's not the water. It's, it's the, the fact that you are giving him thanks for what he did and you're doing it in his remembrance. That's what counts. See, the, the, the legalistic type of, um, well, that's the best way to say it, legalistic type of church. They're hung up on the details of the elements and different things like that. And the whole point is God is not concerned about the elements. He's concerned about the relationship. Amen. See, Jesus didn't come to give us a new ritual. He came to give us fellowship with the Father. And that's what that feast is to, is to be, that we are entering his table with him and recognizing above everything else the relationship we have with him. That's what counts. It's of the matters of the heart, right? Not whether you bought, you know, saltines or pita bread or whatever it is, right? It doesn't matter what you got as long as you are recognizing that you're doing it like they did it in the sense of you're taking whatever it is you're eating, whatever it is you're drinking, you're recognizing this is his body broken for me and this is his blood poured out for me and I thank you for it, right? So, <clears throat> now... Again, I give you a place for some reaction. Take these, study them out, think about them, write down what, what can you do to change it. Now, page 30. It is not enough to agree with Scripture. We must embody the Scripture. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, it says, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And then he goes on, we've already read these Scriptures, so you know them. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name and cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works? And I'll profess them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. And then he gives a story about his words and actually doing his words. Now, in Matthew 21, I don't have it in your scripture, but it's Matthew 21, and I think it starts in 28, or it's, it, might, it might not start there, but I'll get over there real quick. Matthew 21. Yeah, yeah. if you look at this whole section in Matthew 21, uh, <clears throat> down about, oh, let's see, about 23, it says, When he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you will tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? Was it from heaven or was it from men? And they reasoned within themse or with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he'll say to us, Why didn't you believe him? But if we shall say of men, We fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We can't tell. 
And he said unto them, Well, then neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. <laughs> then he gives a story. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go to work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. He came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And he went not. Whether of these two did the will of his father? And they say unto him, The first. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. And think about that. He, he gives another parable here also in just a moment. But now notice what he said. He was telling them, you say you go, but then you decide not to. You say you represent God, but you don't. He said, now which one is doing the will of the Father? The one that first said, oh, I won't go, but later on did. Or the one that said, oh, I go, but then didn't. And they said, well, it was the one that first said, I won't go. And Jesus was telling them, well, that's the way the, the prostitutes and the publicans, that's what they did. They, at first they said, well, no, we're, gonna, we're not going to follow God. But then they changed their mind and they go follow and they did the Father's will. He said, you religious people, you say you, you say you say yes to him. But yet all you do is religious ritual. All you do is these practices and you don't get to the heart of the matter and you don't act like the Heavenly Father. Actually, he told him one time, he said, you actually act like your father, the devil. And he was talking to religious people that did everything just right except they didn't have the heart or nature or spirit of God. We can't be that way. We can't. We have to do this. This is not just religious talk. It's not just a religious sermon. We actually have to, alone by ourselves, face God and recognize where we stand with Him. We have to know that we are right with God. So... Matthew chapter 12, page 31, verse 46, it says, While he yet talked with the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, your mother and your brethren, brethren stand without, desiring to speak with you. And he answered and said unto, them, unto him that told him, Who is my mother? Who are my brethren? He stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Notice how many times, if you go through and look at all these scriptures, you know what word you're going to see over and over again? Do. Not just heal the sick, but do the will of the Father. The Father has a will. His will is not secret. His will is not some mystical thing. You know, it was uh, Augustine that came out and said, oh, God has this hidden will and you don't know what he's, well, you know, you're going through this sickness because of God's hidden will trying to work something out in your life. That's a lie. Okay? God's will is not hidden. It tells us to be wise. Not be, don't be stupid. Don't be unwise, he says, but wise, knowing the will of God. He has revealed his will to us. And all we have to do is do His will. It's not that hard. Right? It just, but honestly, what you want to do, well, you're going to do what you want to do. The key is to making sure that your heart has been changed so you want to do the will of God. It's just that simple. You know, really what we need is just some old-fashioned no-so salvation. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just getting down to it and saying, you know what? I'm going to do what the Bible says. I'm going to live this way. I'm going to make sure that I stay full of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to make sure that if I stay full, I don't have to worry about anything else getting in there. Right? But if you're constantly feeding on 10 different things, guess what? You're going to have mixture and your light is going to become dark. And when your light becomes dark, great will be that darkness. So <clears throat> he says here, he stretched out his hand. Behold, my brother, my mother, my brethren, Whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Now, we're going to finish up here in just a minute. But let's go ahead and go to section or session 6. This is called the 800. We want to talk about this for just a minute. We've mentioned it before. <clears throat> and I'll give you a couple of scriptures. First off, we're going to look at Gideon and his 300 men of valor. In Judges chapter 6, 
And verse 1 says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So they all fled to go live in the caves to hide from the Midianites. And so it was when Israel had sown, they'd go out and sow seed in the fields, that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till they come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. So what they do? They'd, they'd start planting. And every time the crops would be ready to harvest, the Midianites and all these others would come through, sweep through, take it all away from them, and the Israelites would run and hide. <clears throat> then in verse 6, and Israel, and no, I guess we're going to go back to verse 5, yeah. And they came up with their cattle in their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number. And they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet. Notice he didn't send anybody until they started crying. The, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Oprah. That Oprah needs another visitation of an angel. <clears throat> that pertained, <laughs> that pertained unto Joash, the Abbey Ezrite and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And wait a minute. He just said he was a mighty man of valor. Go back one verse. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So here you got the mighty man of valor hiding the wheat from the Midianites. Isn't it funny though? Here's this guy hiding. He could only do it at certain times. They hid it behind the wine press because they didn't want the Midianites to come get it. So he's not too brave. He's not fighting anybody. He's trying to harvest something. And the angel of the Lord shows up and says, Get in, you mighty man of valor. That, that, there was nothing about this boy here that looked mighty or valorous. <coughs> right? He was hiding. But it just goes to show what people see in what God sees. And it's funny, he didn't call him, you coward, what are you doing over here? <laughs> he called him mighty man of valor. Why? Because what he speaks comes to pass. Then he says, and Gideon said unto him, oh my Lord, well isn't that what you'd say if the angel of the Lord showed up here? Oh my Lord. Yep, that's what you'd say. Oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then has all this befallen us? Now, does that sound like you? You ever said that before? Well, God's with us. Why is this? God, why is this happening? Why is this all going on? I don't understand. Try to do right. Try to do this. Try to. I just don't get. Why is all this happening? Doesn't that sound like most Christians? At some point. Well, guess what? If you've ever said that before, pat yourself on the back and say, "I am following Gideon, the mighty man of valor." <laughs> right? <clears throat> and he says, "Why is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of?" saying, Didn't the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord. That seemed to be his favorite saying right there. right? Wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor, in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. In other words, we're the poorest people around, and I'm the poorest of the poorest people. I'm the least in the poorest family. That's bad. I don't have money to raise an army. I don't have money to do all these things. Isn't it funny? The first thing he thought of was how much money he had. God told him to do something, and the first thing, I ain't got money for that. 
Again, how many? Okay, just reach over and pat yourself on the back. So, yep, just like Gideon, just like him. All right. <clears throat> Notice. Then he says, "And the Lord said unto him, Surely, I will be with you." And Gideon said, "My name's not Shirley." No, I'm okay. I'm just, okay. No. He said, "Surely, I will be with you." <laughs> and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in your sight, then show me a sign that you talk with me. Now he's, he's talking to the angel of the Lord. He's standing, the angel, he's talking to him right there. And he said, If I found grace, show me a sign. I mean, who know, I mean just reach back there and pat yourself because you know you've done that before. You know God has shown you something and you've looked at him and go, All right, give me a sign. And he's like, Hello. <laughs> Right here, this is it. Okay. <clears throat> now notice, he said, it, no, but here's the amazing thing too. He said, if now I have found grace in your sight. Look at that, grace in the Old Testament. Hmm, I thought it was all law. No, there's grace. Do you realize, I'm just going to say this one time because I don't want to argue about it. But uh, you, you do realize that the law of God was also the grace of God. You know that? Why? You say, how could the law be grace? Because if God did not want to deal with man, God didn't have to deal with us at all. The fact that he gave us law to try to fix us or show us where we're broken, that's the grace of God in itself. You get that? And then later he showed us how grace worked through Jesus. So he said, now show me a sign. And he said, depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until you come again. Gideon went in, made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh, the unleavened cakes, lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord. Now see, he might have been a little slow. Right? Okay, just reach back and patch that one more time. Okay. And then when he realized it was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And look, now he's getting scared. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, you will not die. If you go back, it's amazing. Everybody that saw the Lord always thought, oh, I've seen an angel, I'm going to die now. And every time the angel says, Look, listen, if I was going to kill you, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I would have just showed up and killed you. Right? And every time, it happened, it's amazing to watch people, how they deal with angelic visitations. Then Gideon built an altar there under the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. And to this day, it is yet in Oprah of the Abiezrites. Now, so the reason I bring that up is because I want you to realize how Gideon started. This, and yet, you look in Hebrews 11, and it says, time does not allow me to talk about Gideon. Right? He's in the Faith Hall of Fame. And yet, you read how he started. He didn't start, he didn't start out by being this <laughs> great man of faith. He was hiding. Right? And every time he turned around, show me a sign. Tell me something. If it's really you, if I've really found grace, oh my God, now you're going to kill me. Come on. <laughs> he didn't start out as a great man of faith. Amen? So we, we've got hope. Isn't that right? So if you've ever said any of those things, guess what? You are prime material to have your name written in Hebrews 11. You're on the right path. Amen? Now, Judges chapter 7, verse 1, and here he goes into, um, yeah, actually I'll go ahead and read it real quick. Then Jerubel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the hosts of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Stop right there. <clears throat> Notice what he said. Gideon, I'm going to use you, but you got too many people. In other words, I can't let you do this with this many people. Now think about that. Uh, because if I do that, you'll think you did it. So I'm going to have to whittle down your army. Right? 
And the funny thing is, you got every little church praying to be a big church. Why? Because if we're a big church, we can do so much more. No, you can do more with faith with a few people than you can with a bunch of people that have no faith. Right? The more people you get, the more needs and the more draw there is on the church. Right? You don't get less needs, you get more needs. But with faith, you can do whatever you have to do. Many times, you ever, it's, it's amazing to watch people. They say, you know what? If I ever get this amount of money, I'm going to retire and I'm going to go into missions. If I ever get this much money, if I can raise this much money, then I'm going to launch out and do this for God. And God is saying, no, 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 no. I can't let you raise that money for that. You've got to trust me for that. You've got to start now. If you get to that point, I won't be able to use you because you'll have so much that you'll think you did it. So the key is to start where you are. As soon as you think this isn't enough, that's your starting place. As soon as you think, well, I can't do that. I don't have the education. I don't have the money. I don't have the whatever. Nope, you're at the perfect place. Right then, you should know right then, I'm at the perfect place because it's going to have to be by faith. You get that? And without faith, it's impossible to please God. As soon as they say, it's going to take $20,000 to do this. And you go, okay, well, I got 19, so I need one more thousand dollars. And as soon as you get there, as soon as you think that, you've already cut yourself out of faith. Because when you get $20,000, you're not going to need any faith to do what you need to do. So the time for faith is before you have what you need. Once you get what you need, it's too late for faith. Do you get that? So whatever, well, I, but you know, I just don't have enough anointing. I just don't have enough power. Oh, see, when you have enough, you won't need faith. You get that? So when's the time to start? When you don't have what you need. When you start, when you don't have what you need, that's when you have faith. Right? I, it, it's funny, we'll, I, I'll be looking at something and say, well, here's what we need to do. We'll get it started. And as soon as we get it started, and I'll say, okay, well, now we need to do this. And we're like, well, we hadn't finished that yet. Well, if we'd finished it, then I wouldn't need faith to do this because I'd be able to redirect things over here. So we need faith now, so now's the time to start it. Amen? You never, never let a project finish before you start something else. I'm talking about with faith. You get that? You always start, you, you keep throwing out there. I mean, you ever seen these uh, fishermen? You know, it, it, let me tell you, if you only have one line in the water, you're not a fisherman. Right? You, you, you're, that's a hobby. Right? A fisherman goes out there to do what? Not to sit out there and think. To catch as many fish as he can. And he'll have this line and that line and he'll have all these lines out there and he's watching every one of them. Isn't that right? And so what are, what are we supposed to do? We should be having our faith out on this. We need our faith out on this. We need to put our faith on this. And if I got any faith left over whatsoever, I need to find something else to put it on. Amen? Amen. You understand that? If you listen to this, I'm telling you, you'll do things for God that you never thought you could do. Right? Everything we've done, everybody told me I couldn't do it. When we started this church, I was told, you'd be surprised how many people told me, don't do it, you can't do it, you're not a pastor. I'm like, never claimed to be. Right? I don't care, all I'm going to do is start it. If God wants it to be a pastor, he'll put one here. Right? Till then, I'll fill in until somebody else shows up. <laughs> That's the way I felt about it. Why? They said, well, you don't have the demeanor for a pastor. I don't want a pastor's demeanor. Right? <laughs> I can be as demean as you want me to be. Right? So, <laughs> so, now, he says here, watch. <clears throat> now, therefore, verse 3, go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. So here you got 32,000 people there. And he says, you got too many people. Send them home. So, okay, if you're, if you're afraid and fearful, go home. And you watch over two-thirds of your people walk off. And you, you know, he's thinking, who? how are we going to, that's going to be tough. Well, you know, at least we got 10,000. And we can, we can do it with 10,000. The Lord said to Gideon, the people are yet too many. He said, what do you mean too many? We lost two-thirds of them already. So I've been in many places where I've preached and we had a Gideon-type revival. That's where it's, you preach one time, and next time you, you've got two-thirds of the people gone. Right? That's a Gideon revival. Right? That's not the revival where they come in. That's a, that's a revival when they leave. Right? So He says, the people are yet too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will try them for you there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whoever I say will not go with you, the same shall not go. In other words, he's saying, you're going to listen to me, and this is the way it's going to be. So he brought down the people of the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that laps of the water with his tongue as a dog laps, him shall you set by yourself. 
Likewise, everyone that bows down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lap put in their hand to the mouth were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And now what that means is the 300 took the water and put it up and lapped it up out of their hand. The others all got down on their knees and put their faces down toward the water. Now, the amazing thing about this, this, this is his uh, system of weeding out the people. What he was saying was anybody in battle that's going to go to battle with you and they get down their knees and put their face in the water, they're not alert and they'll get killed. But the people you want are the people that takes the water and brings it up to their mouth so they can still watch and they're alert while they're drinking. Right? So it's a matter of alertness. <clears throat> now, he says, And the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you. Now that's down from 32,000. Right? That's not even 10%. You get that? Not even, that's 1%. Not even 1%. And deliver the Midians, Midianites into your hand and let all the other people go, every man to his place. So the people took victuals, food and supplies in their hand and their trumpets. And he sent all the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent and retained those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath them in the valley. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you fear to go down... Go thou with Phura, thy servant, down to the host. In other words, I'm telling you to go. I'm with you. But if you're afraid, here's what you do. Take Phura with you. Go down. <clears throat> and his servant outside, unto the outside of the armed men that are in the host. And the Midianites and Malachites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitudes. When Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow. So now Gideon has snuck down to the edge of the tents of the enemy and he's listening to him. And one of the enemy comes and says, listen, I had a dream. And he told his friend, he said, I, I dreamed a dream. And lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay, on, lay down. And his fellow answered and said, this is nothing else except the sword of Gideon the son of Joash, the, a man of Israel, for un, into his hand has God delivered Midian and all the host. Now, think about this. Picture, you see, this is the part you got to get. God is telling Midian to go. Midian goes. When he gets down there, he hears a man telling a dream. When did the man have the dream? Before, right? So God is talking to Midian, or, I'm sorry, to Gideon, Gideon, yeah, talking to Gideon, right? And while he's talking to Gideon, he's giving another man a dream. You get that? And whenever Gideon goes down, he hears the man tell about the dream. Now, the man had a dream of a barley cake rolling into a tent and falling down. Now, what in the world tells you that that's Gideon? God, well, the barley part, yeah, actually. And whenever you sit, but now notice, God had to give the man, the, the guy that gave the interpretation, God had to give that man the interpretation. Because how, how do you interpret dreams? God has to give the man the interpretation. So God gives a man a dream, has him tell it. He gives the other man the interpretation of the dream and says, oh, that's Gideon. And he says, so the host of the Midianites are all going to fall by the hand of Midian. And then he, he had these two men talk about it while Gideon was listening so that it's encouraging Gideon to attack them to bring about the prophecy that he just interpreted from that dream. Now, you tell me God isn't a good chess player, right? That he can get all of these things working together. And, he, and by these two people, he's given Gideon the, the faith, the courage to attack. Right? And then he says, uh, let's say verse 15, uh, verse 14, sorry. Uh, his friend says, There's nothing else than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, man of Israel. God has delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and returned un into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty picture, pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do what I do. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall you do. When I blow with a trumpet and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side 
of all the camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And where do you get that statement from? From the interpretation of the dream. Why? Because that was going to spread through the camp. And as soon as they heard it, they knew they were beat. Right? Now, this is, this is the first illustration we have of what today would be called special operations warfare. Right? Small group of men, armed, well-trained, and strategic, attacking a larger group. And these were these trumpets and all that stuff. These were all force multipliers. Right? And now God is using psychological warfare against the enemy. See? So when we start talking about spiritual warfare and we start teaching that in, in uh, DBI, this is where all this comes in. So you'll see how spiritual warfare works in the principles. It's all through the Bible. And then he says, So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands, and the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. You get that? Israel didn't have to beat them. Midian beat themselves. Amen? And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shittah in Zerath, and to the border of Abel Mahalah, unto Tabith. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because this, and, and I'm probably going to have to come back and finish this tonight. We will, yeah, we probably will. Yeah, we're good. Um, we'll talk about this tonight, and we're also going to do the healing service tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and give you a break. Now you get about an hour and a half, so I took so much of your time. But I want you to realize you never are in, are in a place, and we definitely see this in Jesus' ministry too, you're never in a place where you don't have enough if you have faith. Amen. You got that? If you have faith, you never, you're never lacking. Whatever you think you're lacking, God can make up the difference with faith. So whatever you got, if you said, I need this much, okay? If you have this much and you need this much, if you have faith, God will make the faith be this much. You got that? God will meet and make whatever it is by faith, and it's the faith that you have toward Him. Faith is not an object. Faith is simply trusting God that He's able to make up the difference between what you have and what you need. Amen? Amen. Take a quick break. Y'all get anything?